Welcome back to the Andy Social Podcast. This will be episode 16. I'm going to cheat a bit this week and have a bit of an in-between episode. Uh, no guests this week. A couple of reasons. One, time got away from me a little bit uh, over the last uh, week or so. Um, we're getting into the silly time of the year with uh, Christmas looming only a couple of weeks away. And um, I do have a few guests lined up to do episodes with, but um, I just figured... The way that the week is looking at the moment, I think it's probably better just to focus on getting those recordings done more so than rushing to get another episode with a guest out. Uh, so I'm going to focus on getting them done. There's a couple of really interesting people that um, I haven't quite locked in yet, but uh, if I can, especially one in particular, if I can get this person, it'll probably be one of the most, uh, well, probably one of the more ridiculous guests that I'll probably ever have, but also very interesting. But I won't go into too much more of that until I know a bit more. But uh, the person is interested. But uh, at this point in time, it was going to be tonight, actually, the 7th of December, but it got postponed. Um, now it looks like it'll probably be mid-January just due to timing and schedule and you know that time of the year. So uh, I'll shelf that idea for the time being. But uh, if I can get this person, it'll be pretty pretty crazy. So I thought just to keep the podcast moving, keep the momentum going and keep some content out there, I thought I'd put together a little bit of a rant episode and touch on a couple of different things just so you know there's at least some content out there. So if you get in here, this is fantastic. If you don't, well, whatever. So it's something out there that you can listen to and hopefully get something, something out of it or even just a bit of a chuckle or feel the need to blast me on social media if you think I'm full of it. So there's two sections to this particular episode and I'll get the rant out of the way first and then I'll focus on the second part of it. But there is a common theme here and it's all around flying and it's being at airports. And we've just finished our plane to win tour and we do have one more show. Actually, I will plug uh, one more show. The last show of the year is uh, the small ballroom in Newcastle on the 19th of December. Uh, it's a Saturday and we're playing with a whole range of bands um, up in Newcastle. That'll be our last show of the year. So definitely come out and, and see us play uh, before we go into hiding for a few months to uh, do a bunch of recording and all sorts of things and prep ourselves and get ready for Prog Power in September next year. Uh, that's not to say that we won't do any shows in between, but uh, at this point in time, Prog Power is our main focus um, to get some other things going behind the scenes as well. So we'll, um, we'll definitely reveal more as, as the months progress. So uh, that last show is in uh, a week and a half or so. So if anyone is listening that uh, is either in the Sydney area or uh, a bit north of Sydney, um, heading up towards Newcastle, by all means, come along and, uh, and check us out and it should be a good night. Uh, but going back to what I was saying, the, the tour finished and uh, you know, it wasn't a huge tour, but we, we did a fair bit of flying. And um, I think on average per year, I probably do, I don't know, about 30 to 35 flights a year. And it's not a lot compared to um, a lot of other people that are sort of within the similar circles that, that we're in. But I guess it is still probably above average for for your average person out there. It's funny with flying, especially when, when you're a kid and you first go to the airport and you had that whole experience and, and especially for people that probably fly once a year or, or even less than that, once every few years, it can be quite an exciting place. It's There's a lot of energy, a lot of buzz, there's a lot of people and usually the reason for flying somewhere is for, uh, you know, for an event or for a particular positive purpose, whether it be a holiday or, you know, I don't know, like uh, for some people, they travel to see bands play, they go to, to Europe and go to the festivals or, you know, weddings or anything. So it's usually a lot of great feeling and excitement and anticipation and the airport sort of adds to that, uh, that whole experience because it's a very... It's a very unique uh, sort of place when you think about it compared to other areas that you would normally associate yourself with and 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 um, it's, it's it's a very unique place there's a, a unique social buzz around an airport because it is quite high volume there are particular things that you see when you fly more often that kind of takes the buzz and the excitement away from it and you know some people could say it's the long waits it's the the amount of people it's the expensive food and drink and whatever else that's uh, sold at the airport it could be the fear of flying it could be it could be anything but there's particular things that we've picked up and especially for me that uh, just constantly show 
every time you go there and whether it's a case that you're just experiencing it more so from people that are flying for the first time or people that just don't care or have got no awareness of themselves or or more awareness of other people around them more so than anything else. So um, I thought I'd put together a top five of uh, the the top five don'ts at the airport. Don't do these things. And um, I've got a couple of bonus ones on top of that as well, which I'll add in. But these are things that just I see every single time I go to the airport. And, you know, for me, you can look at the bigger picture and, and not whinge about these things. And they're definitely first world problems. But when you're I think for anybody who's in the same boat as me or a similar boat who does frequent the airport constantly, you can probably um, you can probably relate to some of these things that I'm about to say. So uh, straight off the bat, number one, a large suitcase is not oversized. So don't stand in the oversized check-in lane and don't stand there just because you're in a big group. So you see, for us, we've got our guitars and we've got drum equipment and everything. So it's stuff that can't go into the normal check-in. So not every airline's got this. Um, we're quite lucky with uh, Virgin Airlines that we primarily fly with these days that um, most of the airports around have got their own uh, oversized lane, especially here in Sydney, which is great. So you beat the traffic, you beat the long lines of people, and it makes it easier when you've got a lot of gear. So you can just chuck it on a trolley and wheel it up there and you're fine. You don't have to weave your way through this long aisle. But what we always find is that there's people there that have got their large suitcases. And look, maybe you can class them as oversized compared to a normal suitcase, but they're still just a normal big suitcase and they stand there and they go straight to oversize and unfortunately they don't get declined they don't get pushed back so they they still allow these people to check in the other problem is when you've got a, a party of probably well, i say five or more people they tend to think that they're oversized themselves so they wait in that line as well which is a huge pain in the ass but this is a first world problem and you know we're still there's still bugger all people in the line compared to uh, checking in normally but it always it always irks us when we see someone standing there with uh with their large pink suitcase and thinking that they can check that in oversized probably because it's too heavy for them to carry normally so that's number one uh number two on the subject of bags my rule is if your bag has wheels it's not carry on sorry i'm probably pissing off a lot of people and i'm sure that some of these bags can fit into that little square container thing that shows the size of carry-on luggage but if your bag has wheels that means that either a it's too heavy or b you're lazy as all hell and it should be checked in because the amount of times you get onto a plane and everybody's got these bags and everyone breaks the rules anyway majority of the bags that get put onto the plane are bigger than that box that indicated to show the size of the carry-on luggage limit and if you can't pick your bag up above your head to put it in the oversized compartment then it shouldn't be on the plane now i don't care if you're 70 years old it doesn't matter you check that in and it's just the most irritating thing that you can possibly think of because it's not even a case that you run out of room which happens quite often on flights but the amount of hassle and space that it takes up especially when people are trying to go down those aisles and they're trying to lift them up they drop them on people's heads you know, you open the over, overhead compartments and they fall out. And I'll tell you what, majority of those suitcases that are getting chucked in the overhead compartments are not less than eight kilos. They are heavy as all hell. And unfortunately, they don't really get weighed by the airline and they're not really policed uh, terribly well either. So it's um, a huge pain in the ass. But I know that a lot of people uh, tend to side with the roller bag as carry on because they don't want to waste time checking in the luggage and then having to wait at the baggage carousel after they get off the plane. But, you know, tough titties, that's what you should be doing and stop inconveniencing everybody else. So that's, uh, that's number two. Number three, going through security, if in doubt, take it all out or take it all off and do it in advance. So depending on where you're going in the world, it can change. Some places are a lot stricter than others, but take everything out of your bag. If you've got something that's even has a slight resemblance to a computer, take it out. Just chuck it in the tray. Take everything out of that bag. If you've got guitar gear, take it out. If you've got deodorant cans, take it all out. If you've got drinks or whatever, take it all out. If you've got boots with potential steel caps, take them off. If you've got a belt, take it off. But don't do it in the line standing right there when you're about to go through the security area. Take it off and do everything before you even get to the first table where the trays are. Get prepped and get ready and don't hold the line up when you're stuffing around. When you go through the security thing and it goes off because you've got metal on your steel and you realize that you've still got half your jewelry all over you, 
wrapped around your neck and all over your arms or you've got your belt on still or they keep pulling your bag back through because you've still got crap in your bag that you haven't taken out just take everything out and it might be a pain in the ass that you have to pack it back in but you're still going to get through quicker than taking the risk and seeing whether you get through or not and i'll touch a bit more about uh about that carry-on bag um, a little bit later number four is don't panic the plane's not going to leave without you if you're already at your gate. So if you're standing there at the gate and they're calling to say that they're going to start boarding, don't start pushing to try and get to the front of the fucking gate. Just wait. They usually call out your rows or your sections. Just chill out because you've got an assigned seat. No one's going to take your seat. The only thing that you may have to worry about is your overhead compartment where your luggage is. And to be honest, if you're worrying about that, then chances are you, you're carrying too much onto the fucking plane anyway. So you just need to chill out and know that there are multiple calls and you can really wait until the very final last minute if you really wanted to. So don't panic. Don't get annoyed when other people don't move and they start, don't get up or you, know, you can't get to the front and someone's dawdling in front of you. Everybody's getting onto the plane and the plane will not leave without you if you are at the gate and you're there ready. So just relax and chill out. And number five, once you're on the plane, don't shove people to try and get to your seat. It's not a race. You don't need to panic. As I said before, you've got an assigned seat, so you're not going to lose the seat. You just walk. Walk and stop. Walk and stop. When people stop to put their stuff in the overhead or they go to sit down or whatever, just stop wait you don't have to push past them just wait no one's going to get shitty at you because you're not moving past them just wait and just let people get into their seats there is no rush there's no need to panic whatsoever and it's the same when the plane lands and you're trying to get off the plane yeah okay you might have a connecting flight but pushing through people is not going to make the trip any quicker it's not going to get you off the plane any quicker just relax and wait if you're really concerned about a connecting flight, then call the buzzer when the plane's about to descend so that at least the flight attendant knows that you've got a connecting flight and they can let you know what the best thing is to do. So at least you've got a strategy by the time you get off the plane. But don't push through people. Don't stand there with your head crouched underneath the overhead compartment desperately trying to push through the person in front of you to get into the aisle so you can jump up and get to the bags first. And those dickheads who jump up when the plane hasn't even stopped moving and they're trying to get their bags out, it's just calm down. You're going to get off the fucking plane. There's plenty of time. And the amount of times you see this is just, just so irritating and ridiculous, and especially when people huff and puff and get really flustered and annoyed and anxious because the line's not moving and they go, what's going on? What's going on? Where's the, you know, why isn't the door open or why aren't we getting off? It's just, just fucking relax. What, what can you do to change the situation? Nothing. So just stop, shut the fuck up and just wait because everybody's in the same position as you are. So there's no need to keep walking, pushing through or cursing or getting shitty because you know things aren't going in your favor so just shut the fuck up so they're my five that i thought of off the top of my head that i've noticed uh, quite a bit um just on the last few flights that we've had of this tour i've got a few bonus ones which uh i've just thought of off the top of my head which i thought might be um worthy of of mentioning i did me me uh, mention the seat belt thing very briefly not that it really matters terribly but the light's on for a reason just fucking keep it on until the light goes off. Just follow the rules. Why do you have to break them? Why do you have to turn, take the belt off before the light goes off? If it was any issue with it, then, you know, they wouldn't even have the light on for that long. So just wait. Wait until the engine's turned off. Wait until the belt light goes off and then take your belt off. Because as soon as you start unclicking the belt, then everyone goes into a mass panic and there's this massive rush to get off the plane. Just chill and wait for that light to go off. Um, Mark Furtner, shout out to him because he's uh, notorious at doing this and likes to do it just to piss me off. Another big one, which we haven't had on this tour, but we've definitely had it in the past, is delays due to weather or like an outside, you know, something outside of our control, whether it be a mechanical issue or something like that, or there's been a delay with an inbound flight or something like that. And just people getting really shitty at the ground staff because the plane's not leaving on time or there's been a significant delay or a cancellation or something like that. And just people going off at the ground staff. Now, I understand that people have important things that they're trying to get to and probably things that mean a lot to them, uh, you know, whether it be you know, a family event or a festival or a concert or a holiday or whatever it might be. But in the end, you can, you, you can only control what you can control. And by abusing and going off at the ground stuff at the gate or at the terminal at the chicken can or whatever it may be, is going to do jack shit. So once again, shut the fuck up 
and just wait for the announcements and see what happens. There's no point. There's no point whatsoever. It just it just gets more and more people more riled up. You get more and more upset yourself. To me, even in the worst case scenario, which we've had before where we've been ready to go to and play a show interstate, and we've actually, I think, well, it was a few years ago, we were flying down to Melbourne and we're playing, I don't know where we're playing in Melbourne, but uh, beside the point, we were actually, we were playing the Corner Hotel. Anyway, we were flying to Melbourne and there's massive, massive thunderstorms um, over Melbourne and we actually flew and we were about to start our descent and then they said we'd have to circle for quite some time until hopefully the storm would pass so we can get down safely. And we continued to circle and they said, look, there's going to be another 20 minute delay and you could hear people getting shitty on the plane. And then they said, look, we're going to have to fly back to Canberra because you know, we're, we're not going to have enough fuel and the, it doesn't look like the storm's going to pass anytime soon. So we're going to have to go go to Canberra, we're going to have to land, we're going to have to fill up and then we'll fly back to Melbourne. So you can hear people like getting agitated and, and swearing and whatever on the plane. But, you know, you sit back and you just go, well, that, that sucks, but you know, what can you do? So anyway, we're halfway to Canberra and then we had another announcement saying Canberra Airport is full because all these planes are flying to Canberra to do the same thing that we're doing. So instead, we're going to fly back to Sydney and land in Sydney so we can refuel. So we're pretty much going back exactly where we were coming from. And... So everyone's getting shitty again. And then we finally land in Sydney and we and thinking that we can just sit on the plane and wait. They make us all get off the plane and stand around the gate and wait. And we wait and wait and wait. And people are getting more and more agitated. And there was announcements and they're saying, look, you know, we can only do what we can do. The storm hasn't cleared yet. And there's a lot of traffic. We have to wait for our queue. There was planes before our hours that were, that were delayed already. So we have to sort of try and keep it in order. And eventually they just said, look, unfortunately, just due to timing, we have to cancel tonight's flight. We don't have another scheduled flight that we can put everybody on just because of the number of people um, that are already trying to get to get to Melbourne. And you should have seen everyone. They were going off. People were getting really shitty and they were going off at this ground stuff. And there was some guy that was just going, what are you going to do about it? I've got a bucks night that I'm trying to get to. You're ruining my night and blah, blah, blah. And I want compensation. You know, the usual opportunist or you know, over entitled douchebag and you know the ground stuff oh, you have to feel sorry for them because they oh, customer service sucks in general anyway and it's a it's a hard thing to deal with the general public and especially when there's a testing time where people are getting challenged you got to commend it to them and just pay a lot of respect to to what they have to put up with and try and keep their cool through it but for us it was quite stressful because we had a show that, that night and by this stage i think it was like 6 or 7 p.m at night it, or maybe about six ish or something like that so suddenly we thought well that's it we're not making it down so there's no other, no other virgin flights and then luckily we went up to uh back up to the check-in area and we went to uh jetstar the other airline uh competing airline just to see if they had any flights and that luckily they did and um, we were able to purchase new flights which cost us a fair bit of money and um, but it guaranteed us a flight to melbourne we got in got a taxi the taxi took us straight to the venue and we got there within like 20 minutes before we had to get jump on stage. It was just perfect timing and it was a crazy storm. I think the venue itself had flooding and um, luckily the show still went ahead and um, it was, you know, it was a it was a crazy afternoon, evening, but we still managed to make it down there. But I think even if we couldn't, I mean, there's only so much you can do and there's only so much, you know, cursing that you can you can make and and. You can only get so shitty with it because it's all outside of your control and nobody uh it's nobody's fault i mean in that case it was just mother nature i mean what what do you do there's just nothing you can do so i always remember that that particular moment where people just were just totally unreasonable and just treated the ground stuff like shit like they were just just plebs and and like they were criminals even to a degree it was just these people were getting so offended and and entitled that they were just causing grief for for the people at um, at virgin so it was a it was a real shame just to see uh see douchebag humans just uh showing their showing their true colors so um that's a big thing for me and and i'm i'm a sucker for it at times when you know i'm getting tested by ground staff sometimes when ground staff are not having a good day and they're a bit short I tend to uh, <laughs> to to take the bait sometimes and and snap back or get a little bit smart and run my mouth. But um, usually that's six o'clock in the morning when I've had an all nighter and probably still drunk and the ground stuff don't want to deal with me anyway. But um, I think the general rule where possible is you just just don't abuse the staff, don't don't be rude to them, be cool, be relaxed, and even when they are not in the best of moods, just rise above it because they've got a shit job. I don't. 
there's nothing glamorous about being an attendant or working for an airline or working at an airport. I don't think you're dealing with every person under the sun. You're dealing with a high volume of people every day. You're dealing with all sorts of scenarios uh, and a lot of negativity, especially when things don't go to, to plan. And because it's such a high volume environment, a lot of people are anxious all the time and pan and they're panicking, especially for people that don't fly often because they don't know, understand the process. They don't understand where they need to be. They're always checking the time and they're very easily irritated. So the ground stuff have got a lot to deal with. So even those times where they are a bit short and rude, that's that's a challenge that I constantly have where I have to rise above it. But um, as a general rule overall, I think you just need to need to be as cool as you can with, with the ground staff because they definitely got a hard job. And on the back of that, just be polite to everyone that works at the airport, you know, whether it be the air, anyone that works for the airline, the security, anyone that works in the hospitality, businesses at the airport. Once again, they're all dealing with a lot of people constantly flying in and out and various um, backgrounds and personalities and, and whatever. And um, you know, security, notorious, I think, anywhere in the world of uh, being quite ruthless or just very short and blunt. And, and they're dealing with a lot of stupidity just every minute of, of every day that they're there. And um, if you can try and be cool and prep yourself, like I said earlier, with going through security as an example, uh, it just makes life a lot easier for yourself. But sometimes they will even show their appreciation as well. It just makes the whole process smoother. It gets you through quicker. All these things get you through quicker. If you just have a bit more awareness about yourself and not be the center of attention, then you'll, you'll tend to get a better experience and you won't be as stressed and overwhelmed and, and inconvenienced um, if you're able to just to keep calm and get through um, without any fuss and I'll probably on the back of that again so I'll just keep going on the back of everything here don't stand in the middle of the walkways with your luggage so whether that be a check-in or the gate or you know wherever else or in the aisle just if you're going to stop and this isn't like this is anywhere if you're in the city and you're walking around or you're at a train station or wherever it might be if you're walking you need to stop to whether either check your phone or check a map or whatever it might be don't just stop in the middle of the thoroughfare don't just put your bags down and stop walk over to wherever a wall is get away from the traffic stop and then work out what you need to do i see so many people walking off escalators and stopping right at the bottom to put their bag down or to put their bag down to pull that fucking handle out of their roller bag just keep carrying that bag off the escalator and walk off to the left or to the right and then pull your handle out and then keep walking oh, I, that one irks me so bad and it's just something that's common sense and it's just having awareness of of what you're doing but what everybody else is doing around you as well and that's just common courtesy so just be more aware and mindful of people that are around you and probably the last one which is um my last of my bonus ones i'm just thinking off the top of my head and this is one that i it's not so much a an annoying thing that i find but uh, something that i've experienced in the past and uh it's something that I, I learned my lesson almost the hard way is that don't throw away your boarding pass. Don't throw away your boarding pass, especially if you've got the bag stickers on the back of your boarding pass. And even more, especially if you've got connecting flights somewhere, because if you lose that boarding pass, regardless of whether that boarding pass is needed for the next flight or not, you will be potentially fucked. I did it once when we we're coming back from Europe a few years ago. I was a lucky guy that had all the baggage tags placed on the back of my boarding pass. And for whatever reason, I misplaced it. And we had to get a connecting flight, but we actually had to pull our bags off and then check them back in onto another flight. Um, this was in, I think, Abu Dhabi. And I lost my ticket. So I couldn't find it at the time. The chick basically said she can't do anything without the baggage stickers um, we made a big song and dance we we're on the phone trying to work out what to do she told us if we we weren't going to make our flights and then you'd have to wait you know another day or so for the next flight available flight to sydney it was an extremely stressful moment and then luckily very lucky because i was being probably not the most pleasant of people at that time even though it was my fault so a great example of uh, what not to do she got on the phone and managed to make a few phone calls and they were lucky enough to, to locate all of our gear so we weren't talking about a couple of bags it was quite a quite a number of items and they were able to ensure that they got onto the correct flight and they um and we were able to get to our gate just in time before the uh the plane left there was a lot of mad dashing and swearing and and stress that was circulating around that moment but that was all because i misplaced my boarding pass the boarding pass that i didn't think i needed anymore that had all the freaking bag tags on the back of it 
funnily enough, when I got home back to Sydney and I started going through my bag, I did find that boarding pass and it was sitting in a pocket that was just one that I thought I'd put my hand through, but uh, obviously didn't uh, pull everything out as well as I could. So something that if I just probably spent a couple of extra seconds looking a bit better, I probably would have uh, alleviated a lot of uh, stress and swearing and whatnot at the time. So uh, sorry, guys, for, for doing that. My fault. So anyway, um, that's a few things there. More so the top five of my don'ts at an airport. I'm sure there's a lot of other ones that are out there that um, people think of when they go to the airport, especially a lot of my friends that do a lot of uh, frequent flying around the place. Um, if you can think of any others, let me know. Um, and I'm sure the ones that I've mentioned are are ones that um, others can relate to as well. A lot of them, you know, first world problems, but when you travel so often and you're around so many people, these little things start to show a lot more than um, than they probably do if you only travel once or twice a year and you're more concerned about the excitement of going somewhere more so than the mechanics of how to get through each stage at the airport, which uh, we tend to be these days. And we're definitely all about uh, routine and, and trying to get through and minimize the amount of time that we're uh, we're stuffing around um, at each stage, whether that be checking in security or at the gate. The second part of this podcast, while, you know, I've got a mic in front of me and, you know, creating content as you do, a lot of people ask me about um, my rig that I take on tour. And I thought this, you know, on the whole topic of airports and traveling and bags and whatever, I thought this might be an opportunity just to touch base briefly on um, what my rig looks like and, and what I take with me on tour, because I've I guess in comparison to a lot of other touring musicians, probably quite a unique touring rig. Um, within our band, it's not because we more or less all have the same rig, but it's definitely uh, very cost effective, very easy, user friendly and um, has minimal impact, minimal stress and um, labor involved to, to get this rig around the place. So my entire rig travels in my carry on backpack. I've got a shitty black Kmart backpack, which I've noticed that quite a few other people <laughs> from within the Australian uh, metal scene have also bought this backpack, which I've had to be very careful that um, that I don't mix them up and, and pick up the wrong bag at shows when we play together. But um, I've got this crappy backpack that I bought from Kmart, which I'm about to retire because it's definitely getting on its last legs. And in that backpack, I've got a number of things. So I've got my Line 6 base pod. that. I've had for six or seven years. I could not tell you the model number off the top of my head. I'm sure uh, Tim, if he's listening to this, will know straight away without even looking it up. I don't have a row case for it. So what I do is I just wrap it up in a towel so it's nicely padded and that sits in the bottom of my bag, usually on top of a pair of jeans or a pair of shorts. So it's just a little bit of extra padding on the base of the bag. After that, I have my head, my amplifier. Um, which is a Galligan Kruger MB200. So it's just a little 200 watt base head. Um, this thing's tiny. It's like the size of a hard drive. And funnily enough, the row case that I put it in is not even a row case for it. It's an old hard drive Velcro clip soft case that uh, Mark had a couple of them at home for whatever reason. So we ripped the uh, bottom legs or knobs off the bottom of the of the head. And so it can slip straight into this uh, this little little soft case. So it's literally 15 by 15 centimeters, very, very small. It's tiny. It does not look like it would do the job, but it packs a punch. So that with the Line 6 uh, pod is a great little uh, combo. And obviously when you go and play interstate or wherever, you just can utilize a local uh, cabinet just to plug it all through. So they're together. And that's my rig in a nutshell that sits in my backpack. Kilo wise, that combined together, you're probably looking at about five kilos. So it's very, very light. Um, I also just have my um, power adapter that is also my bag. All my leads that I use, patch leads and um, actual guitar leads and speak on cable, power cables, I have them all wrapped up in my um, guitar case. A couple of reasons, it's just less shit in my backpack. It also takes the weight out of my backpack, so it's less that I have to carry onto the plane. It does add weight to my check-in luggage, but Luckily, when you fly with Virgin in Australia, you do get a musician's allowance if you're a 
songwriter through APRA. So I can afford to have um, that little bit of leniency with um, putting the extra cables into uh, my guitar case, which is great. So majority of the cables all sit in my case. Sometimes I'll have my wireless system in my backpack because it's extremely light, or I'll just chuck that into my guitar case as well. For anyone who is interested, it's a Line 6 Relay G30, which I have only had for about 12 months, I think. And it's been quite good. It's the best wireless I've ever had and, and I've had a few over the years and um, this is the first one where it doesn't have any of those flimsy antennas hanging off the, the top of the, of the receiver or the transmitter. So it's definitely um, a lot more durable and it can be thrown around a bit more and it's very, very tiny. It's probably the size of um, like a, a wallet, roughly about the size of a wallet. So it's extremely small, it can sit in the side pockets of my carry-on bag or it sits um, into in my actual guitar case itself. Very, very easy, very simple setup and um, haven't had any issues with it whatsoever. And I know a few other people who have uh, picked up that system since Mark actually uses it as well as, as myself. Yeah, highly recommended if anyone is looking to get a, a wireless unit, um, especially for club-based shows. I'm, I'm not sure about um, sort of the largest scale stuff and what sort of range, but I'm sure, it, I'm sure it'd be more than sufficient enough um, depending on what other devices you've also got running at the same time and you know that's that's probably the big thing is just to keep in mind what other other units and um, channels are running at the same time um, which you know can get quite messy but for a normal setup with with a with two or three guitars um, running wireless and maybe a mic then it's it's more than sufficient these um g30s have six channels i believe so you do have a little bit of flexibility um it's not anything crazy but um, it definitely gets the job done for the majority of the shows out there and for most musicians so it's quite good other little silly things that I have in my bag up until recently i would have um the tour itinerary so every tour thanks to dan who was our um, old manager he used to have a template tour itinerary that he always put together when we went away for shows that just outlined um, when we all need to be at the airport, all the flight details, where we had to be, where we're going, addresses, contact numbers, times as far as sound checks, line checks, load ins, set times, etc. It was all in the itinerary um, to a particular format. And we've more or less kept that for the last almost 10 years. So I'm the one that puts together them every time we go away for shows. And um, I, would, I used to print them off, but now I just keep them on my phone along with um, any what used to be printouts for hire, hire cars or hotels or any or other transport or whatever it might be. But that more or less all now sits on my phone, apart from a couple of odd things that I'd I'm not used to that. I'm not sure whether they'll accept something off my phone. I keep little silly things like black textures, felt pens for a number of reasons. And it's not so much that I've always got a pen to sign stuff, you know, because I'm such an egomaniac, but um, they're good to have on hand, especially when I'm setting up merchandise and I've run out of signs or don't have anything left. I can get some paper and, and write out prices or write some stupid stuff or write a stupid sign or whatever. It's good for set lists as well in case we um, don't print off any set list for a particular run of shows. They're just good to have on hand. It's like an extra tool there just to get you out of trouble if um, if you get stuck on anything. There's nothing worse than being somewhere and needing to write a set list and then all you've got is a biro, like a pen. You just end up having to write over it a million times just to make it bold enough that you can read it while you're on stage. So the black texture or Nico or felt pen or whatever you call it, um, I usually have a couple of them in my bag just to get me out of trouble in those um, circumstances. Also have a packet of Alkaline AA batteries. Um, these are for my wireless, but I also have them on hand just in case something else is needed. I also keep a bunch of extras in there because Mark always forgets to get his own and and on the odd occasion, maybe Tim might need one as well. So it's just good to have some extra ones there and not have to worry about scrambling to find a convenience store to buy batteries for wirelesses or whatever else we decide that we need to chuck batteries into. So I always ensure that I try and keep a few of them. They say not to put batteries in your backpack on carry-on, but I've never had an issue with it. So until otherwise, I just keep doing it. The What else do I have? Uh, I've got Dead Oil Hand Gel, a great little uh, thing to have when you're running around, especially um, using a lot of public restrooms where there's no soap. For whatever reason, I, I cannot understand how a public restroom can't have a $2 container of soap, little pump thing in there. But for whatever reason, and people are assholes and they don't 
give a shit about hygiene and they make sure people don't put, uh, especially in pubs and, and venues, for whatever reason, it's just, you know, they're tight asses and they can't spend $2 on, on hygiene to look after the people that are paying money to use their venue. But also, you know, sometimes at airports as well, for whatever reason, the dispenser's broken or has run out and you just have to sort of wash your hands with water and the dead old stuff is is a godsend because it's just so many germs around and sometimes you should just been carrying gear you get that sweat and the shit off the handles of the of the equipment and whatever it might be so the dead old stuff can be quite good i've just got general pens biros and whatnot just in case i have to write anything down or just feel like i don't know writing something i've got just generic flyers and business cards that um for the band and for the podcast podcast and all that, which I always just keep a few in my bag just in case I strike up a conversation with somebody in transit somewhere um, where I normally wouldn't have all my stuff on hand. So it's good to have that. I used to carry a few promo CDs as well when we had some um, available, but uh, they're all gone now. So, but the flyer and the business card are quite good. It's just a little memento just to pass on to somebody if you've had a had a good conversation and just something that they can look into further if they feel, uh, feel the need to later on. Always carry four or five magazines and probably a book as well. Magazines are usually, I don't know, something like World of Knowledge or Nat Geo or um, Strange Geographic or New Scientist, Time, I don't know, something that's relatively interesting and informative. Um, and then whatever book I'm currently reading at that time, if it's something that's really thick and a hardcover, then I won't bother. I'll just grab a smaller book that I haven't started yet to read, but I've got like a pile of 40 books that I haven't even got through yet. So there's always more than enough reading material, but always bring four or five magazines because Mark usually gets into them and, and reads them on the plane as well. So always catering for the, for the other guys especially when I'm on those longer flights just to keep everyone occupied. What else do I have? I've got wet wipes. They don't usually come in handy too much unless you're doing more of a, a longer run of shows If um, and you just can't get to a shower. It's just something just to keep you relatively fresh until you can get to the next spot where you can actually properly clean yourself. Especially for me, I just get so oily. So the wet wipes are quite good just to just to take the edge off and make you feel half human. What else do I have? Uh, probably the two other things that have two final things I can think of off the top of my head. I think it's called a Sigenet. Um, I think that's the brand. I've probably completely butchered that, but it's a battery um, phone charger. So it's just this battery brick, um, rechargeable battery, and um, you can get them from JB. I think they retail for about, um, well, the one I've got's a um, 11,000 milliamps. So it's quite tank. It's, it, it, it can, you can get a lot of charges out of it. I reckon you could probably get several full charges out of this brick without recharging the brick itself. It's heavy, but it's not ginormous. So it's not overly heavy. Um, so it's probably, I don't know, a kilo maybe, but it's an absolute godsend. I used it in the States and it was the best, especially when I just didn't have time to stop and plug into an outlet or just couldn't find an outlet. It was just perfect for, for that. So um, I take that with me everywhere now. It's, it's really, really good. The only downside to it is that it takes a long time to recharge. So you definitely have to plug it in and just leave it overnight just to give it a really, really good charge. But um, as far as charging your phone, the phone can charge relatively quickly from, from the battery itself. So it's um, it's definitely highly recommended. They can be a little bit expensive depending on the size that you get from JB. But uh, if you do know anyone that works for JB or you work for JB yourself, then the discount is quite significant. So uh, definitely make friends or, or sweet talk one of your mates that works for JB because they'll get a great um, employee discount. I think it'll go from somewhere like $80 down to about 30. Highly, highly recommended to do that if you can get away with it. And the last thing, which is a bit of a joke really, because I've never used it, is I've got a gym membership for Anytime Fitness, which uh, for people that aren't in Australia, it's just a 24-hour gym um, that you can just access, well, no shit, you can access it 24 hours a day, duh. I've just got a little access swipe card thing and I always have it in my bag just in case I'm in the vicinity of a gym and I've got idle time, which has never happened and it probably never will happen. And I like to think that um, there'll be this opportunity where I'll have time to waste and, and I won't know what to do. And there will just happen to be one of these gyms um, across the road or just around the corner and I'll be able to go there and work out, which um, yeah, good luck with that actually happening. But I live in hope and it's in my bag anyway. So it's it's like the old Boy Scout thing. Um, it's better to be prepared than, 
then uh, then feel sorry for yourself later on. So um, they're the main things in my bag. There's usually other little shitty things in there or tiny things. Like I I usually keep a few loose picks in there um, just in case I lose um, the other ones that are in my case or uh, in my wallet or whatever it might be. Um, And then, I don't know, it's just just other rubbish that sits in my bag that is probably just accumulated over the months that I haven't bothered to clean out properly. Probably one thing that someone might be able to argue this point or at least uh, challenge it. One thing that I don't put in my bag, which I've had grief with in the past and I've just learned not to bother taking the risk, is gaff tape. Now, anyone that is a musician or works in the music industry as far as you know, live entertainment goes, everyone knows how valuable gaff is. Gaff's not cheap to buy, so you're usually paying like, I don't know, 15 bucks a roll for this stuff. It's great. It, it, will, it fixes almost everything and it's just an absolute necessity to have as a touring musician or as someone who's road crew or anything of the sort. And I've unfortunately had rolls of this stuff confiscated off me because it's gone through security in my carry-on and they won't let me take it onto the plane because, well, I guess it's uh, probably a weapon or something that can be used to restrain people with, you know, whatever. So... Um, I learned my lesson from that and ever since I just pack the um, gaff into whatever check-in luggage it is, whether it's inside my uh, guitar case itself or it's sitting in another bag, merch bag or whatever it might be, just because it's just not worth it. Not when you're paying 15 odd dollars for a roll of gaff. This stuff's gold and you really have to keep an eye on it even when you're at shows because the stuff just gets picked up by anybody and disappears very quickly it's just it's fantastic stuff and and anybody who plays in a band or tours or you know is road crew or works in a venue definitely understands uh the gold that is a a roll of gaff tape so anyway that's enough of me i'm crapping on i just thought i'd give a little bit of an insight as to what my rig looks like and then i guess the other shit that um, i carry around in my backpack overall it's relatively light and it definitely keeps under the the weight limits that um that the airlines ask for with carry-on so it's very very um non-intrusive and um, minimal effort minimal stress it's all my back and even after a show when I've, I might be strapped for time, I have to get stuff off the stage really quickly or we have to load out very quickly. I can literally just pick it all up and I can shove it into the backpack. While it's not the best method and it's probably not the best thing as far as longevity of the equipment, it's great that I can just pick it all up in one heap, chuck it all in the bag and then get back to the hotel or wherever we're going and where I've got a little bit more space and time, then I can unload it, wrap it all up properly, wrap up all the leads properly and then pack it up um, the way that it should be. But it's just great that I can pretty much pick up my entire rig in my arms and you can all go into one backpack and and, uh, you're good to go. Uh, There's just so many people out there that still take massive guitar heads with them they're taking these big rigs, these valve or these tube amps or whatever it is. And I understand it to a degree. I understand, you know, these things cost a lot of money and they they produce a, a great sound. And for a lot of people, it's their trademark sound. But a lot of these pods that you get these days, you can download this stuff. And while, yeah, okay, it's not authentic. It's not the true thing. It's it just takes away so much stress and so much worry and it just looks ridiculous when you rock up to the airport and you've just got especially those bands that take like several guitars with them on tour i mean unless you're playing bigger venues where you're you're averaging probably you know thousand capacity venues a night where you, your touring budget's a little bit bigger and you can justify different tunings and different guitars during your set and whatever and you've got an actual proper rig you know rack mount system and whatever then yeah you can get away with that stuff a bit a bit more but um, you know, if you're just a normal club touring act, you don't need that shit. None of that stuff's necessary. There was even one band that we played with in Perth, who I won't name, but anybody who's listening who uh, may be vaguely connected with uh, with the, the, the show that we played or maybe just um, know the, the show that we played earlier in the year in Perth will be able to connect the dots. But this band travelled from the East Coast over and they brought like entire rack mount systems with them with these giant guitars and it was just out of control. And, and look, you know, they... They had a relatively good sound, but it was just totally unnecessary. And they would have paid an absolute fortune to lug all that stuff across the country just for a half hour set that they played. And um, and they didn't terribly, they didn't seem to be terribly impressed with being there anyway. So maybe it was because they were lugging too much crap with them. Yeah. So it's just a different perspective, a uh, different approach that we take. Mark and Tim use exactly the same setup. They've got their own guitar pods. Uh, Line 6 pods, they've got Galleon Kruger heads 
And Tim's got a different wireless system. He's got an older one that I think he needs to replace soon, but Mark's got the same wireless system as I've got. So we're more or less completely emulated uh, across the three of us, um, all got the same setup. It's just so easy. We can download the, the, the sounds that we need. We've got a consistent sound no matter what. It's all DI'd, so we don't even need to mic up cabs or anything, any bullshit like that. Our sound's completely controlled on stage. You know, we're not at the mercy of some shithouse martial head that someone keeps trying to convince us that there's a clean channel that we can play through. You know, we just bring our own head. We've got our sound. We know what we're going to get. And it's just that consistent uh, consistent trademark that, uh, that we're known for. So it's definitely a major major benefit that we've been able to make for ourselves over the last few years of, uh, of touring. So anyway, um, that's it. Enough ram- rambling on. Uh, I've got a few more recordings doing this week, uh, as I mentioned before. And so hopefully if all goes to plan, I'll have another episode out next week. As always, jump onto the Facebook page, like all the posts, just do that general sort of activity on social medias just so the stuff gets shown to more people. Jump on iTunes, do a rating, write a one-liner, just say how amazing everything is. And um, yeah, just spread the word. I mean, don't spread the word about this episode because it's just rubbish. And if you're, if you're still listening to this, then fuck, just find something better to do. But, you know, all the other episodes that I've done to date, if there are particular things that are interesting that you might uh, think that a mate or somebody you know might uh, think uh, is something of interest, please pass it along. Um, I definitely want to spread this out to as many people as possible and uh, there's a lot of cool things on on its way as well in the future. So anyway, enough rambling. Uh, Until next week, cheers and speak soon. Bye.